And so I want to first start by talking about resilience. Um, I love this quote from Louisa May Alcott. I am not afraid of storms, for I am learning how to sail my ship. You don't have to be an expert sailor to sail a ship. You have to, a lot of times, you know, we get expert, we become expert by making mistakes. We become expert by going through experiences. And so whether you are a newbie or you've been through many financial storms, it doesn't matter. You're still learning how to sail your ship. So I hope I can give you some ship sailing pointers today. So what we're going to cover, um, I want to talk about resilience um, as a uh, an equation. Re resilience is strength plus flexibility. We'll dive into what that means. And the strength part, even though this we're talking about money, the strength part of resilience is emotional and psychological strength. And so I'm going to talk about research into the psychological um mindset factors that can help you have a stronger financial mindset and, and really boost your financial well-being, even in your current circumstances. Um, and then the flexibility part is financial flexibility. So how do you build a financial life that has flexibility in it? So we'll talk about the financial strategies of diversification, income, investments, and uh, insurance, and how those things can help uh, create flexibility. So uh, just to dive in, um, let's talk about resilience. So when we talk about being able to go through uncertainty, we cannot get rid of uncertainty. And as Linda said, we have so many things coming at us all the time right now. And it, it feels to many of us as if the pace and the magnitude of uncertainty has gone up. Um, and, and maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. Um, who's to say? But the, the point is that we can never get rid of uncertainty altogether. There will always be storms, no matter what you do. If we try to control everything, um, we end up nervous wrecks. Um, and yet, if we don't control anything, we're just blowing in the wind. So the concept of resilience is something I want to talk about because resilience is a very special thing. It's that ability to bounce back. And resilience has these two interesting components to it. Uh, it involves strength, but also flexibility. And what I mean by strength is I want to show you a video now, a tennis ball, we know it's soft, but did you know that a tennis ball actually changes shape that dramatically when it bounces? That is a combination of strength and flexibility. Strength because it has a structure to the outside. If that ball was made of slime, it would stick to the wall. It wouldn't be able to bounce back. It would change its shape so much that it couldn't regain it in it couldn't regain its former shape but it does it goes back i'm just gonna go back here a little bit um and show again it changes shape but it it has strength enough to regain its shape so there is strength there um but there's also flexibility. If it wasn't, if it was only strength and no flexibility, like glass, it would shatter. And so the the trick to resilience is this combination of strength and flexibility. And so in thinking about where strength where we need to be strong and where we need to be flexible in order to have to build lives that can be financially resilient then we need to um think about the strength is actually coming from emotional and psychological strength and the flexibility is in the financial strategies that we can use so to dive into strength how do you build strength in your financial mindset? We'll talk about three supports and some confidence builders. So how do you bounce back after a financial crisis? Um, there's, so I, I did, I wrote an article um, in the fall about um, how people have managed after unexpected layoff. 
Um, and so researchers followed people at large factories who uh, experienced mass layoffs, and they followed them and and found out what factors, what psychological factors and financial factors, et cetera, what were the factors that were most strongly correlated with or the strongest predictors of being happily reemployed three months later. So bouncing back even better than they were before, being happily reemployed, not just reemployed, happily reemployed. And so what were those things? And they found these three um, types of resources. And so I think of it, I think of uh, emotional strength as a three-legged stool. So if you want to be able to bounce back from financial crisis, you do need financial resources, of course. Um, and these, in the case of job loss, these can be in the form of a severance package from the company that is um, is laying you off. Or um, if you're fired rather than laid off, it could be in the form of unemployment insurance. Um, it can be savings. It can be alternate income streams, which we'll talk about later. Um, also, your financial resources um, are not necessarily just savings. It's uh, whatever financial resources you have access to, including public ones like in like uh, unemployment insurance. Um, also, one of the biggest predictors of uh, financial resilience was strong self-esteem. And notably, when you have a, a um, well, with layoffs in particular, it can really damage your self-esteem because we connect our identity with our work uh, so deeply. And so you have to find ways to protect your self-esteem and to rebuild it. And the uh, employees that were able to do that, um, generally what they did was they reappraised the situation so rather than seeing it as, oh, this is terrible, this is such a tragic thing, they saw it as an opportunity to take, to turn, you know, to change some things and to make a positive change. They basically said, look, this has forced a change in my situation. It's up to me whether I make that change positive or negative. And so they engaged with things like um, resume building, skill assessments, and found when they looked at their at themselves on paper that actually they are pretty employable. They look pretty great. And that built their self-esteem about their value in the marketplace. And so they were able to go back out there confident, uh, which of course helps when you're looking for a job. Confidence really helps. And third, social support, having people that have their back emotionally, not financially, emotionally. And that social support was useful in venting negative feelings, but also in helping uh, to reappraise the situation more positively and in boosting self-esteem. And so of the three-legged stool of what helped people bounce back from what is often, what can be one of the biggest financial crises in people's lives, is a sudden unexpected loss of income, um, the two out of the three supports aren't financial. They're psychological and emotional. So it really is important to have a mindset to psychologically prepare yourself for resilience. So let's talk about confidence, financial confidence. I'm going to show you some um, research that uh, was done at Morningstar. Um, I did this research. Morningstar is an investment research firm that I worked at for nearly a decade. And I did some research on the relationship between confidence and financial well-being. And the way I measured confidence, I apologize for the words cut off um, on this uh, slide, but um, I, I just asked people how much they agreed or disagreed with the statement, I can handle whatever comes my way financially. And so people on a scale of one to 10, um, they answered this question. And I would like you right now, nobody has to see it, um, but what would you answer on a scale of one to 10 of your 
agreement could you how how much could you agree with saying i can handle whatever comes my way financially where would you put yourself and once you've got that in mind i'm going to show you this emotional well-being so now the i know that the text here is really small so i'm going to read through this for you so i wanted to measure people's emotional experiences with money and this is actually going to require a little bit of math and some pen and paper to in the past three months um how often and you know you don't have to be too exact about this but just in general lately how often have you felt each of these emotions with respect to your money Okay, so over on the left hand side, we're going to start with the negative emotions. So we've got here, um, we have anger, helplessness, stress, fear, and sadness. Those are the, the five negative emotions. And for each one from never, uh, what I want you to do is score yourself from one to five. So if, if you say for anger, if you say, well, I never feel angry about money, well, then you would say never, and that's a one. If you say I constantly feel angry about my financial situation, then that's a five, okay? Half the time is a three and so on, all right? So you'd give yourself, so you write down the page. Um, so let's say anger, three, uh, helplessness, two stress four fear two sadness four whatever it is for you um write down those numbers and then add them all up everybody should have a number that's between five and 25 because if you said never to all of them that would be five ones equals five and if you said constantly to all of them that would be five five so it's 25 so you should have some number in between five and 25 so on your paper, put negative equals that number, okay? Now we wanna do the same thing for the positives. And just in case you can't read them, the positives here go from top to bottom. Joy, peace, satisfaction, pride, and contentment, all right? Now, what I want you to do is subtract the negative from the positive. Okay, so if you have a positive 10 and a, if, you're, if your negative score was say, let's say if your negative score was 10 and your positive score was 15, you would say 15, that's the positive, minus the negative 10 equals five. So your total would be five. So we're taking the positive emotions, we're subtracting the negative. So every negative emotion negates a positive one. And so you should end up with a total score somewhere between, where does it end up? Um, somewhere between negative 20 and positive 20. What I found when I asked people these two questions, I asked them about their financial confidence, and then I asked them about this emotional well-being. I asked them a bunch of other stuff too, um, but those were two things that I looked at. And with hundreds of people in this study, what I found um, was I, I was looking at the relationship between these two things. And so if we look at financial well-being score by confidence. So what we've got here on the, the graph on the left shows the results of this big study where on the x-axis down at the bottom, we've got that confidence score from zero to 10. And on the y-axis, there's that's a financial well-being score that um, was the result of this um, big uh, survey that they took that was, you know, it's uh, designed for measuring all sorts of financial well-being um, or aspects of financial well-being. And you can see a very positive relationship, right? The, the higher their financial well-being, the higher their confidence. Or you could say the higher their confidence, the higher their financial well-being, right? But of course, income matters, right? We want to, it's, it's easy to say, oh, well, the more confident you are, the uh, higher well-being you have. But, well, how much you make should matter, right? So over on the right, um, this is um, that financial well-being score separated by income and confidence. So on the right-hand graph, the way to read that, to interpret that graph is that on the, on the bottom line, the x-axis, we've got income groups starting with 
uh, people making less than 25,000 a year, um, going up uh, to between 25 and 50K, 50 to 75K, 75 to 100, all the way up to 150K plus, all right? So in each income group, there's a certain financial well-being score. But then I split the groups between people who scored uh, less than or equal to five on confidence. So remember what you said on that score from, from one to 10? So um, the people who, who said five or less on confidence are the blue line. And the people that scored greater than five are the orange line. And what this shows us is that in every single income group, the people who had higher financial confidence had higher financial well-being overall. So this measured things like um, not just um, how they felt they could handle, you know, if they felt like they could handle a, um, a setback, but all sorts of aspects of overall financial well-being. And so this confidence, um, this one question of confidence seems to be getting at something, something deep in our financial well-being. Now, if we look at this confidence by those that emotional score, um, on the left-hand side, this graph that in the middle, it, where it says zero, that zero going across the middle. Now, if you had, if you said, if your negative score was 10 and your positive score was 10, you'd have a total emotional, you'd have net emotions of zero. Basically, you know, same amount of positive as negative, we're calling it neutral. All right. And you can see that as people and the zero to 10 along that axis is their confidence score. So you can see people that scored five had an average of zero net um, net emotions. And if you scored less than five, you're pretty negative overall and greater than five, pretty positive. And another way of looking at this, again, breaking things down by income, because I think it's really important to show that income is not the biggest driver of emotional well-being when it comes to our money. So in every single income group, every single income group, with the exception of the 150K plus, uh, and even they are barely positive, Everybody who had low confidence about their ability to bounce back from hardship um, was experiencing mostly negative emotions with their money in general. And in every single income group, every income group, including less than 25K a year, if people were confident that they could handle whatever comes their way, confident that they could bounce back after hardship, then in general, they were having a more positive experience with their money overall. And this is important because confidence really drives behavior. Our confidence is at the core of our ability to make good decisions. And so if you were scoring, if your score is less than seven on confidence, we really want to build that up. OK, and that's before we even change anything about your finances. You need to be emotionally and psychologically strong in order to make the good financial decisions that you need to make and in order to be able to keep your head when things get uh, stormy. So how do we do that? Well, there's some really simple ways to build your financial confidence. One of them is to focus on things that matter, but also just the things you can control. There are lots of things that matter that we can't control. The global economy, war, uh, social unrest, we can we can participate. We can we can be part of um part of of conversations and actions about that, but we are not in control of their effect on our financial lives. We can't control what will happen globally. Um, and then there are things that you can control that really aren't that important. And so focusing your energy there, um, not really that, that useful. Um, and it's in that sweet spot of what's important and what you can control. And so that's what we're going to talk about in the second half of this. Um, confidence builder number two. So just one more thing about confidence builder number one is if it's something outside of that, practice letting it go. 
And, and one of the best ways to just let it go is just stop the thought. You don't have to talk the thought down. You just, you just let it go. If, um, don't you, you let the train of thought go and you don't follow it. Confidence builder number two, um, most of us have been through at least one financial hardship in our lives, maybe more, and we have rebuilt. We have bounced back. Maybe it was tough for a time. Maybe we had to lean on people for a time. Maybe we had to start over. Maybe we had to rebuild our credit. Maybe we had to you know, spend years um, paying off debt, but we did it. And if you have done it before, you can do it again. So building your confidence, often if you're if you're lacking in confidence, just tapping into the fact that you have done hard things and you can do hard things can help give you that confidence boost that you can do it again. And confidence builder number three, name your emotional supports. Okay, so take your pen and paper and write down the names of at least two people that you know will love you even if you had no money at all. Even if the worst happened, these people will still love you. Just write their first name down. It has been shown in repeated studies that knowing that we have a strong emotional support network can help us break out of um, uh, what is it called? Rumination. Uh, when you get spinning and trying to make the numbers work and and you can't and you lose sleep. If, once you get stuck in that rut, it's not useful. So if you start, if you can think about the people who love you, it helps you take a breath and it helps you remember that you are more than your money. You can, you will still, you will be fundamentally okay. Um, and knowing that people care about you can help you take a breath, can help you tap into confidence. So these are the things we need to keep our mind on to, uh, to be mentally strong so that when the storms come, we've got the coping skills to handle them. So that's the strength part. It's psychological strength. It's mental strength. It's emotional strength. Now we're going to talk about flexibility. What do you do to actually make your financial life more flexible and therefore more resilient, more able to bounce back? So we'll talk about diversifying to reduce risk and ensuring to cut losses. So diversifying, we usually think of this in terms of investment, like diversifying your stock portfolio, and we will talk about that. But I think it's really important to talk about diversifying your income streams, okay? Because especially when we're talking about times with, you know, possibilities of layoffs or recessions and inflation, diversifying your income streams is really, really important. Now, Economics 101 teaches us that we only have three ways to generate income. They are labor, land, and capital. Okay, now labor we're all familiar with. You, you generate income from wages, from your salary, from a side hustle, from you know any physical or intellectual work that you do, that's labor, and it, produ it can produce income. Land is like, it's real estate, it's also land you know there are in in maine for example there are many people who have plots of land and and um contracts with forestry um companies that will periodically come and take the timber and they use this land to generate income there's also ways to generate income through uh through land um through things like you know renting out a room in your house. There have been times in my life I have right now, I have a, a one room in my house that I'm renting out to someone who just graduated from college. It's an extra $500 in my pocket every month. And it it is nothing to me. It's wonderful to have her in the house. Um, and so those little ways of 
increasing using whatever you've got whatever resources you have to generate income getting creative how can you do it how can you make more of the resources that you have to increase your income streams and to have different types of income streams because if you have if you only have labor income and you lose your job that's really scary but if you have labor income and income coming from land and income coming from your investments, your capital, then if you lose your job, it's still scary, but you still have some other things to draw from. And that is the benefit of diversification of income streams. So capital is financial, but also physical. So if you have a car, you have capital. You could rent it out in a car share program. When I lived in Washington, D.C., I did this. I didn't use my car. I didn't need my car. And so I let people drive it. I got paid just to park my car on the street and people would rent it and drive it and then return it. Um and, and there are lots of ways now that more and more than ever um, that we can turn the, the everyday things that we have by sharing them with others, we can... Um, we can earn extra income. And then, of course, capital is your investments, your portfolio, um, your savings, your, um, your uh, 401k, all of that. So here is a really important thing to understand. If you have no land or capital yet, you must rely on labor for income. You don't have another alternative. Even Social Security is labor. It's, it's from labor that you've put into the system or others. Um, if you want to stop laboring, you must have land or capital to generate income if you want income above Social Security or if you are trying to uh, stop laboring before uh, the age of collecting Social Security. So this is so important to understand that labor alone, you can't stop laboring unless you have other income streams. How do you build them? Land and capital. So quick question, and I would love if anyone would just shout out for a second, um, what are some non-obvious ways to earn extra income and which category would they fall into? So like I mentioned car share, right? I've rented Uber. 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 Yeah. Really Uber. popular. You know, some, yeah, some of the happiest people I've met are retired people who drive Uber and they're like, you know, I'm retired, but I get to choose when I work. This is great. I get a little bit of extra income. The, I, I choose my own hours. I work for myself. Really happy. Yeah. What else? Babysitting. Yep. Yep. Babysitting. You know what else um, is like babysitting on steroids? foster parenting or mm. one way that i um one way that i um earned extra income a couple years back was having a foreign exchange student live with us which was an added bonus because i got month i got a monthly payment for her to live with us um my daughter is planning to go to the same country she was from and when the pandemic hit I had two teenagers in the house. Like my daughter had a companion in the house rather than being alone all the time. So it turned out to be this incredible blessing um, above and beyond just the, the financial. So um, fostering, um, hosting for an exchange students, um, there, there are ways to, oh, and another one that you may not know about is um, yard sharing. So you can actually register, if you have a yard, like a fenced in yard, you can register that on, um, and, and people will rent it as like a, a temporary dog park when they're traveling or if they don't have a yard and they just want a place to be able to take their dog and there isn't a dog park around them, you can actually rent your yard out by the hour as a dog park. I mean, there are so many ways that you can take what you, what you have and by sharing it with others, make a little bit of extra income. Dog walking uh, I, for that matter too. <laughs> yeah, dog walking. Um, and and so often, you know, these things can also be things that you love to do that are hobbies that you can just um also make a little bit of extra income on. Um, I have to keep going, but I, I love this um topic. I just think that um there's there's so many more ways to earn money than we often think about. Um, okay trying to advance. All right. So this is a really overwhelming slide, and all this is meant to uh, show is that when it comes to um, our investments, 
there is no one type of stock that is always a winner. So each color on this graph, so uh, the columns are years from 1995 to two, uh, 2015, and each color is a type of stock. So either like a, a growth stock or a value stock or a blend. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. But what you see along the top is so on the, the higher rows are the best performing that year and the bottom is the worst performing that year. So if you look across, you can see like, let's just say the red ones, S&P 500 growth stocks. From 1995 to 1998, they were the best. They were really, you know, generating a lot of return. And then 99 and oh my God, by 2000, they're way down at the bottom. In 2003 to 2005, they were the worst performers. And then, you know, they're back up there again. If you look at all of these, there is no color. There is no type of stock investment that is always the best or most of the time the best or always the worst or most of the time the worst. And the lesson of this is trying to pick stocks, even trying to pick like section of stocks is a losing battle. We diversify because we don't know what type of company is going to do better? We don't know if there's going to be a tech boom or a biotech boom or if um or you know if if somebody's going to cure cancer and which company is it going to be? All these things we don't know. And so diversifying is about getting out there and having a little bit of a lot of things so that the things that do well, you get a little piece of that. And then the things that do badly, you know, yeah, you lose a little bit, but you're not like losing your whole shirt. So, or, or your whole nest egg. So diversification is about protecting yourself from, um, from being completely at risk. But the question I want to ask here before I get at this is why invest in the first place? Why not just save? Here's a clue. If we look at, these are different types of investments and it's showing for each one the potential gains, the size of the potential gain, and the size of the potential losses by the investment type. So over on the left, we have cash. Cash, there's no potential gain for cash. There is some potential loss through inflation. And inflation is why we invest. Because if you just keep your money in cash, it will lose value little by little over time. And inflation has gotten a lot of news lately, but we've had inflation with us the whole time. As long as you've been alive, there has been inflation. There have been tiny, tiny periods of deflation where the value of cash goes up, but they're short-lived. And usually inflation, if you look at the, the um, average, it's it, if you average it out over time, it's usually about it averages out to about 3% per year, which doesn't seem like much. Something that costs a dollar today will cost a dollar and three cents a year from today. Doesn't seem like much, but it adds up. It adds up and it compounds. And so we've really seen inflation. Um, people are paying attention to inflation now because it's higher than it's been for decades. Um, and so we hate that feeling of our money losing value. Um, but it's really just turned up the volume on what was happening all along. Our money is always losing value if we just have it in the bank. If they're not paying you interest, if you're not earning interest on your money, it's actually losing value. Usually it's only losing about 3% a year, not 10% a year, but still 3% of loss is still 3% of loss. And so keeping all your money in cash is guaranteed to lose value over time. Um, so putting it in savings or certificates of deposit, then you have pretty much a guaranteed um, uh, gain, no potential for loss there because there's it's a contractual agreement and it's insured um, up to $250,000 uh, if it's an FDIC um, account. Bonds are... Uh, you can earn a little bit more in bonds, but you also have a little bit more potential for loss. Stocks, uh, like a, then we get into like different types of investment portfolios. So if you have 50% stocks and 50% bonds, you can earn more. You have the potential to earn more, but you also have the potential to lose more. And it goes up. So as you get more uh, risky, 
you have, yes, you have higher potential for gain, but you also have higher potential for greater loss. And I really take issue when people talk a lot about, well, no risk, no return. And that's true. Like, yeah, you don't, you don't have the opportunity to grow your wealth if you don't invest, but it does not mean that more risk equals more return. More risk means you could make more money. You could also lose. There's also a higher probability that you will lose the money you invested. And so if you look at like individual stock picking, yes, you can make a lot of money. There is a small probability that you will make a lot of money stock picking. There is a high probability that you will lose a lot of money stock picking. Because if you can't even know what's going to happen with a whole group of stocks, knowing one company is almost impossible, what the future of one company is. So, and then you get into even more speculative things like art and crypto and all these things. And yeah, again, you could like playing the lottery, you could win mega millions, you probably will lose. Um, and so you, we want diversification, not just of the stocks that you have in your portfolio, but of all the types of assets that you own. You, we diversify because we want to get some gains. We want to beat inflation, but we also want to protect against losses. So we don't want to put all of our nest eggs into the risky stuff. We want to put a little bit into the risky stuff and some into the less risky stuff and more, you know, so you diversify the types of investments that you have. And another thing that's not on here is real estate. That's also an asset. And so having a whole portfolio is like, it's your stocks, it's your bonds, it's your real estate, it's your land, it's your income, it's your um, cash. It's, uh, it's, it's a little bit of everything and you want to be able to diversify it because then if one of them does really badly, you still have all the others. And so people that freak out because the stock markets are down, I, I really have to wonder how much of their wealth have they exposed to potential loss. If you have diversified, if you've set your financial life up that you've got a little bit in risky assets, but you got more in moderate assets, and then you've got some in safe assets, then even if those risky assets lose everything, you've still got the rest. And if you've diversified your income streams on top of it, then even if the stock market is down and you lose your job, you've still got other streams of income. And you've still got other uh, assets. And so this is the flexibility part of resilience. If you have more, if you've diversified your income and your investments, then you can be flexible when situations change. Um, okay, so last thing, I, I'm just going to skip over that. The, the biggest thing about insurance is that there are some things, uh, insurance is about cutting your losses. Diversification is about, con you know, limiting the amount of risk, sort of balancing risk and return. Insurance isn't about risk and return. Insurance is just about cutting your losses. So if you were to lose your life, who would be impacted by the loss of your salary? And so life insurance allows to replace that salary or the money that your salary would have um, generated for the people. Um, so it, it it cuts the losses that other people will experience if you were suddenly not able to earn income. Um, other ways to protect your income in life are health insurance, so you can stay healthy to work, disability, both short and long term. And then you want to protect your assets, protect the assets you already have. Liability insurance, we have those for our cars, for our homes, if you, if you have a mortgage. Umbrella insurance is another thing that you might want to think about. I recently learned, for example, I have a large uh, dog that is a dangerous breed, and um, if I don't have umbrella insurance, then I could lose my home if my dog were to bite someone and they sued me. I mean, I take precautions against that, but one of the precautions that I take against total catastrophe 
is the insurance that could cover uh, something like that if it were to happen. So protecting my home, protecting what I've built over time by insuring against catastrophe. So you insure to cut your losses, you diversify to balance the, um, the potential uh, gains and losses. So just to sum up, um, there's always going to be uncertainty. Storms will come. Resilience is a combination of strength and flexibility. And the strength is emotional. It's psychological. It's your financial confidence and your support systems, your emotional support systems. The flexibility is in your financial decision making and how you set up your financial life. That's by diversifying your income streams, diversifying your investments, and ensuring to limit your losses. If you do those things, you will be as set up as you can. It doesn't mean bad things won't happen. It means that you'll be able to bounce back when they do.